Welcome everybody to another great episode of Real Life Matters. I have here today somebody that knows a lot about black history and how everything evolved. This is what he studies, this is what he does. And without any other further ado to introduce to you, Nazapa Zap of History's Mirror. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. How you doing, Mr. Boss? Been a while, been a minute. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. How you doing with the COVID and all this stuff? You know what? I've been warding off marauding bandits and fighting off zombies, but I'm kicking it well. Wow. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. Well, you know, you got a lot to talk about. And, yes, yes. And today, and you know, a lot of people want to know what you do. Right. You know, and how did you come up with um, your history's mirror? How did you come up with that? Okay, so I, I would say that history as a passion or as an innate part of myself has been from ever since I could remember. Okay. Like uh, as a young child, I always had questions about when well, I used to hear about slavery and black people popping up everywhere here and there. And in public school, I would actually, you know, take out books on pirates and very interesting subject matter for myself. And I would always see lots of images of black people as cargo on ships and, just a lot of things were not explained. And when I asked those questions to teachers or my parents, I always got a lot of misinformation. Oh, what happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago? I'd be like, oh, will it ever happen again? I had no understanding. So what I realized from a young age, if I wanted to get answers that I was sought out, I would have that as my personal quest to acquire those answers from the questions that I had. And that's basically the very birthplace, the verse, very birth seed of history's mirror. Yeah, and tell everybody where you come from, your background and stuff, because this is, you know. Okay, well, <laughs> well I used Trinidad, you know, because my, my parents are Trinidad, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Trinidad to the bone. Um, TNT. Born in K TNT, proud Canadian. Uh, both sides of my parents' family, my family on both sides originate in Barbados, but as we all know, we originate from the motherland, Africa, originally. So I have two nationalities, that I'm very proud of is my heritage. Oh, I didn't know you had a Bayesian in yes. your background. Well, Five I generations. You, I find out new things every day about people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we want to get so people can know about, well, history's mirror. Right, you're right, right. History's buff. Mm -hmm. And we want to dive right into this. You know, um, you know, um, why is black slavery, is, why, is, why is it so important, you know, Okay. Black history for people to understand the slavery and the, how that all happened. Okay. I'm glad you asked that question. Oh, gosh. I'm really glad you got that question. I adjust myself here. <laughs> you have to adjust because yourself. Because uh, there's a lot of individuals, as you know, who would like to downplay it and say, well, we all were slaves and everyone enslaved each other, which is true. Do not get me wrong. That is true. However, the reason why there's this angst and there's this sense, of, this air of uncomfortability with the topic of black, and I'm not talking about people specifically pinpointing certain horrors that occurred during this uh, time period. It's just the fact that there's this irky uncomfortableness that happens when we speak about slavery. Could it be possibly that it was most recent? It's not even 200 years ago, like 160 something years. And the ripple effect is still affecting everyone to this day. Hence, prejudice, racism, and whatnot. Now, the reason why it's it's very, very special, and I'm not saying that in a positive way, the transatlantic slave trade, which specifically deals with African-Americans and those of the Caribbean and South America and here in North America, is that it was chattel slavery. Now, are you familiar with the term chattel slavery, the no, boss? No, I would love to ask okay. you what that is. So, okay, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. Okay, because slavery is like, so we think about Romans, they conquered, okay, and that was very much the same way in Africa, too. You conquered your enemy. Instead of slaughtering them and cutting their throats, you just take them captive. You know, pillage, take their women and children, sell them into slavery. That's fine. When it comes to African slavery, it's more like Russian serfdom, when you would have people who'd work the land. Uh, sometimes you could actually marry into families or, or they'll be actually a part of that community, even rising up the chiefdom, chiefdom states, uh, chiefdom positions, I should say. Where it seems to be different with the transatlantic trade is exactly what it was. It was a trade, a trade in black people. So it wasn't just like slavery. Slavery is just enslaving in people, enslaving uh, uh, individuals against their will. However, 
you have an actual universal trade that included many major powers of Europe from the Dutch to the Portuguese, to the British, to the French, you know, even, even, uh, um, I was going to say, I, uh, Finland even had a little small hand in it. So this is something in the United States, of course, Spain, everything just became make profit off the Negro. Mm -hmm. So are you familiar with the transatlantic triangle or not? You know, you're trying to put me on a spot. No, I'm right? not. No, I'm not. No, no. I want you. To, I want you. To, I want you to. Say, I want yeah. you to say no. no. I want you to say no, no so that no. I can give the answer. Yes. Okay. It'd be. It'd be. A, it'd be a big issue if you actually said yes. I do. That'd be like, oh well. Um. Well, can I talk about it anyways? Okay. Oh, yeah, so no, as, as well <laughs> calculated out. So I would say that. Okay. So the triangular trade is also called the transatlantic slave trade, is when from the old country, which would be like Europe. Let's just say England. Okay. okay. They will take cheap manufactured goods, say from the port of uh, the harbor of Liverpool, like whiskey or rum, uh, firearms, cheap firearms, cloth, beads, cowrie shells. They'll stock them up all there, and then they'll bring them down. So this is the first leg of the of the of the, of the trade, the triangle. Then they go to primarily the west coast of Africa. Now, from the west coast of Africa, they'll be there for say. I don't know, anywhere from like a year, two years, or even like a couple of months, it all depended on how long it took for them to gain the cargo to fill the hold of the ship. And the cargo, that being of black people, to fill the hold of the ship. From once they dumped off all the old goods, or the, the cheap goods, I would like to say, because a lot of it was cheap, they got their cargo, human beings, black flesh. Then from there, they'll sail to the new world, which would be, South America, the Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, uh, Brazil, Canada, even, uh, and uh, North America, uh, sorry, United States. Right. Okay. Now, from there, so let's just say we'll, we'll stick with Trinidad. So they'll go to Trinidad and then they'll dump off the, the blacks captives. That's when they actually become enslaved. Then they take on all the manufactured goods, the produce that was acquired through slave labor, like the sugar from sugar vein cultivation, coffee, tobacco, uh, byproducts like molasses, rum. From there, they load up the ships and then they bring the goods all the way back to the old country like England again. So that's how you have the triangle trade, which is another name for the transatlantic slave trade. So many, many business, uh, the Dutch were used as middlemen. Um, the Portuguese used to supply, provide uh, black captives to the Spanish. Um, so the, the, the really in, to, to understand it more, we have to look at how it even happened and how it even came about. Because a lot of people wonder, okay, so why black people? Why did that start off? And that's one time. That's one thing I want to take this opportunity to to enlighten individuals to know that it wasn't just straight up that black people were deemed as subhuman and and slave worthy. Actually, that was that that mindset through pseudoscience came about through time when people were questioning the triangular trade. In order for them to justify doing such things okay so are you ready for the you ready for yeah, it but I, what oh, oh, I want to oh, know is oh. like if the people you know for the caribbean mm -hmm. if the slaves the slaves came from Af africa mm -hmm. and then they brought them to the different islands right is that right that? and you know what here, here here's a very very interesting okay. fact i'm glad that you kind of went on the little view here do you know uh there's a there's a special word that that people from the Caribbean, who made it to the New World? Okay, so the, the, the first went to the new, first they went to the Caribbean, and then say they were brought to United States, okay. as opposed to. And let me ask you, okay, so both y'all here. If I was a, uh, I want you to fill in the blank, okay, of a song, okay, right. okay, okay, you, you'll get it, you'll get it, right? So, tis the to be jolly. La, 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 la. So what's the word now? Tis the season. Okay. Okay. Now, once you when you want it, when you wanna, what you like to do to put some little spice and kick on some meat? What you do? You put some seasoning. Okay. Now, what's the past tense of once you season it? You call it. It's been seasoned. seasoned. Okay. That was black people. Oh. We were actually during the term from the Caribbean seasoned. Why? Why? Because if you were an American planter and you go to the slave auction, okay, and you're there in Virginia and you have a fresh cargo 
prime Negroes coming straight from the motherland. And then you have slaves that came from the motherland, went to the Caribbean, and then as a next leg came to, the, to Virginia where this planter is. The seasoned one would be fetch a higher price because they've already been exposed to the Western culture. They've already been broken. So just think about it. It's very sad that I have to compare it this way. But if you take a wild horse running in, well, I don't know, in the Iberian Peninsula, well, not Peninsula, but like, you know, they're running away. And you have a horse that's been broken, so it's not wild. It's been domesticated. It knows how to take commands. It doesn't, won't resist. It knows how to fear the rod. It knows, right? And then you have all this work to do with this one. You have to even catch it and throw a saddle on it first. Which one do you think would fare a better price? Which one do you think would be more deemed uh, um, valuable and even desired? It's the one that would be less work that you can get the most productivity out of. And so a lot of uh, African-Americans don't realize that a lot of them, if they have certain Caribbean ancestry, it will be deemed seasoned people. And it's hard for us to say, okay, well, if I do an Ancestry.com, it's going to show that I'm Jamaican. It's going to show that, no, because our genetic code comes from the African continent. So we'll have the actual DNA makeup of the indigenous peoples from certain specific geographic regions. So that's the one thing. So I'm showing you, like, in terms of veering off a little bit, it was good how Caribbean Blacks, they could be also transported uh, to another leg, aside from the triangular trade, into the America, into the United States, but they would actually uh, fetch a better price. It's more difficult. I ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a lot of people say, because if 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 the people in the Caribbean they're mixed with, you know, they're mixed, mm -hmm. then people like to use this term. Oh, the slave masters were really up in your in your culture or in your family. If you guys are a bit mixed, that like a lot of people, well, you know, because then it's a dip because you know they had different different mm -hmm. kinds of blacks in the slave trade. Some worked in the house, mm -hmm. some worked the field, some worked in the farm, and, and it was according to their color. You, you know what? Well, uh, yeah, that's part, that, it, right? it, it, part that, 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 that it depend honestly it depended on the owner, right. what you liked. Some of them liked their wild, gamey, dark meat, and then some of them, and, and it's actually pretty sad that there was actually very, very like there was actually breeding. It, it comes after, oh gosh, there's so much ways to cover, there's so much things to cover, <laughs> but there's actually breeding plantations, and there's actually uh, some people who actually made quite a good living actually producing and having literally breeding uh, uh, blacks. And of, of the mulatto sort. Mm -hmm. So even if you're like one fifth black, you're still considered black, but that man, you know how much money that would, that would especially for female. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, and it was a form of prestige to have these certain belly warmers or, or women that you keep dainty just specifically for the master's sexual desire. So when his friends come over to visit his plantation, this and that, he'd be like, oh yeah, hey, Toby, go get Carolina. Hey, wait till you see this one here, <laughs> Carolina. Carolina, rub your master. I'm serious, that's how, that's how it was. And, even when it comes to the black men, there was a certain way too. So just because like lighter and fair does not necessarily mean better, better because no. you could be put at harm's length uh, and risk constantly. And at the same time too, when you're dark skin, like dark as a cave entrance and you're muscular and whatnot, you, your life could be totally exploited and, and put through the ringer because of what you could use, what you could be used as, as, as a laboring mule, uh, forcing you to uh, have sex castrating you if you did not have that body that they wanted and desired so they could actually bring on the next generation of a crop of, of youth, of chillings, of pickaninnies as they call them. So uh, there's a lot of different intricate things that came to the mixture of, of, of blacks in the Caribbean per se. And I want to also emphasize that we must not always be focusing on the shading of, of, uh, of our skin because no matter how you look at it, even if you take the Caucasian blood out of the equation, and you just look up strictly the Negro, there'll be constant, constant, steadily, steadily, steadily made mixtures. And I'll, I'll prove my point because someone could be like, well, and I actually watched actually on YouTube, someone do their DNA thing and they couldn't really, conf they were confused about I'm sub-Saharan African, but I'm like this, or I could be that, or I buy this, but they weren't able to dif differentiate it. And the reason is this, we'll stick with England as, well, they were the most biggest power uh, powerhouse in the slave trade anyhow. So let's just let's look at British colonies, okay? Trinidad is a good example. Jamaica was one of them. 
all along the West African coast, there was up at one point during the, the climax, the height of the transatlantic slave trade, up to 80 European forts, like castle fortifications. It wasn't against the indigenous people populations. It was to protect their interests against other Europeans that might want to jeopardize their ventures. Now, logically, if through all these 80 forts during the golden age of the transatlantic slave trade and the age of piracy, that uh, goes hand in hand, believe it or not, you would, the one country like Spain, or sorry, like, like Portugal or, 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 or um, Britain or France would have their own territory. That's so they'll make their own deal with the local authority, the king, pay their rent, have their castle there, and they'll acquire their slaves from that geographic specific location. Now, once that fort gets taken over by another power, then, okay, we'll, we'll look at the Caribbean. So we'll say, say Trinidad was ran by England, okay? England got their slaves from a specific location in Africa. Now, Trinidad got took over by the Dutch, say. Then the slaves that were coming now, we're not going to be coming from the, the British territories that were in the west coast of Africa. They'll be coming from where the Dutch were, okay? And the English take over again. So now you have all these Africans from over here, way up the coast from a different fort, whatever the indigenous group could be, they could be Akan, they could be Fulani, they could be whoever. Mm -hmm. And then you have like the Wolof or the, or the, or the, uh, the Wolof, um, yeah, Mandinka, all these different kind of Mende people, they be coming from different spots. So through time, when they bred slaves, when slaves would by choice want to get with each other, you have all these different ethnicities of African peoples mixing with each other throughout time. So if you look at the African-American, you don't know how many different bloodlines it could be because you could be sit, you could be sitting there five, you could be three generations enslaved, and then someone comes straight off the boat from Africa during the latter ends of the of the Civil War, say in 1863, and fall in love and produce a child. Now that child will be considered what? Because there's so, do you know what I'm saying? There's so many different mixtures that go on with inside it. So is it is is not as so cookie cut black and white that a lot of people would like to look at it as. Right. Well, the question. You know, a lot of people, like, there's so much things to delve in, you know, like, the Zappa Zap has so much knowledge, and you have so much, you know, you, you really Thank have you. to bring it back. We have to dissect a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's hard to dissect it because you have so much knowledge. But, you know, the question that a lot of people want to ask, and, you know, that always, there's always debates and arguments, mm -hmm. you know, did, did black people sl uh, enslave other blacks? Did they well, sell I, I, out? Okay, so, yes and no. That's the answer. It's yes and no. We have to look at now. We have to look at again. The well, I already mentioned earlier how during the transatlantic slave trade that sorry prior to that, or even during now blacks enslaved blacks, but it's more res, uh, reminiscent of Russian serfdom. So as I shared earlier, that some blacks could even rise to the uh, state of chieftain, uh, marry within the family, be part of the community. But it wasn't like there's was, there was an element of humanity of course is is a each to each their own type of scenario depending on the specific ethnicity and the specific owner however it was not uncommon for blacks to actually sell themselves into slavery during famine um blacks if that would be a uh, punishment for a criminal conviction was enslavement or a serious debt these were the ways that slavery was practiced in specific uh communities in the west and central african uh landscape now, for your question in terms of selling out, selling out, no, I, I, I really, really, it really ruffles my feathers when I hear, well, you all sold each other out and this and that. Well, that's that's like that's like saying Napoleon Bonaparte when he was going during his conquest of Europe, that he was conquering his own French people. It doesn't make any sense. There are white people. If there was a classic distinction between an uh, Irishman, a Scotsman, an Englishman, a Frenchman. How is it all blacks are painted into this one, one bunch, this one category? So when you had during wartime, which often a lot of times Europeans would actually uh, instigate and it's called uh, double talk. They would, they would pit certain powers against each other and sit back and wait for the spoils of war. So seeing how slavery was already a practice in society, instead on, on their list of uh, items they want to acquire, it would be like, hey, thank you for the spices. I like that ivory. Got some gold. Hey, uh, mungonge. 
who is that uh was that there is that one of your captives oh yeah we got him um during our last war with the wolf oh yeah how about if i give you a little extra coinage for that guy right there now but keep in mind slavery was already established in the the new world when it came to in uh the indigenous peoples being enslaved and being oppressed they died real quickly because they had no immune system to the european diseases even the smallpox, the common cold, would wipe out a whole entire village. One in th three in five blacks would perish. As a statistic I was given in certain coastal regions due to malaria. And they had an immune system. So it was like the opposite. So Europeans couldn't go in the hinterland of, of, of the continent of Africa because they would be susceptible because their immune system wasn't so strong. But blacks made the perfect candidates to be taken over the slave labor that was those deeply 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 uh needed in the new world whether it be in south america in the caribbean or the united states so now that demand comes up now okay so now before it's just a trickle before it's just like little items like Mboko, who, who was that guy now it's more like there's a prime mission to get enslaved africans so now they're like okay let's make allies let's make let's make alliances okay oh fine and often at times too which a lot of people don't realize that when there was a certain indigenous political power going against another one, sometimes the alliances would be made with, with alliances would be made with having an allegiance with European powers who would lend physical support, like actually lend manpower and guns and weapons, or just give them guns and weapons on a credit and sit back and wait for the spoils of war to come back to them, which was the captives. So the African king or queen who is fighting an arch rival could be a tribal ancient nemesis going back generations. Instead of slaughtering and killing them, they would beat them, subjugate them, take over that land. And they're looking at like domination, no different than any other powers in this world it's has seen through like, it. Right. Yeah. But it's almost like what we're, what's happening today. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's fighting, you know, they're fighting for their rights. They're fighting for their, you know, their ways of life, right? They're fighting for their ways of life. But this this is very specifically in the way of like, if I'm a kingdom, the white man's here. The white man has guns and cannons. The white man can help me out with this. The white man's going to fight with me to acquire this. And all I have to do is just give him the captives. All right. I become wealthy. I become more powerful. And so therefore, they were going against other people, other groups. So again, it's no different than, than an Armenian having a battle with a Turkish person, right? Or, or, or a Greek person. They're of the same race. However, they're not necessarily their own. So they weren't selling each other out. So that's why I don't look at it. We're, we're, we're peoples that happen to be black, right? We're all united, but we weren't necessarily specifically selling each other So there out. you have okay? it. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Are you tell me the that time's that gone? That oh my that gosh. That that yep, it goes time away. flies. It, it flies when you're having fun. Flies. <laughs> Oh my you know, gosh. We gotta bring about, if people oh, yeah. want you to, to, to come, uh, you know, where they can find you, if you maybe the, if you want to do a speaking engagement. Uh, okay, absolutely, like absolutely. So we go All right, so first I want to say thank you for having me. Yes. Okay, I really We're appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Plan on it. I just want to say that, okay, we have a lot of few, a few things that are actually coming up. Um, a coalition has been formed. We have uh, a lot of big plans, but I'll, I'll share a little things I want to leak. Uh, hopefully this November 26 uh, coming, I will be at the Keep Six uh, Org, uh, created by uh, Richard Miller. I'll be having a talk there for youth mental health uh, as it, it, uh, issues that are happening in the city, in the Toronto, and for us to empower our youth and our community as a whole. You can actually catch me at uh, Facebook, History's Mirror, History's Mirror with a S, capital H, capital M. And you go on my page, you can see all the content I put on there. In the meantime, before my show hits the airwaves again. And also, too, if you want to see what I'm about and a bit of my personal life, you could catch me at flying underscore elbows on Instagram. Again, that's flying underscore elbows on Instagram. And again, I just want to thank you and Mr. Riley for having me here in this <laughs> lovely studio. Man, my, I think my, my butt's already molded in here. I, I, I like it. I like it. Okay, I got to 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 Okay. Okay. But anyways, I do want to thank you, and mm -hmm. I do want to thank the viewers for tuning in today. Yes, I want to say a uh, big shout out to my homegirl who recently passed away, Erica B. You know, Janet, love you. The family, spirit is with you. Much love, strength, happiness. Uh, 
these times come, but we will persevere. And I, I love you so much, Erica, and I miss you. And everybody in the Caribbean to tune in to, for Real Life Matters and follow me on um, Instagram, dboss underscore one, Real Life Matters. You know, just like the page, it just takes a second. So anyways, thanks. So bye for now. <laughs>